We do not live in a system of equality. However people want to identify, that's okay. It's an attempt to make women go back to the days of silence. Speaking up makes the world safer for the vulnerable. Successful prosecution could, under our rules of law, actually be sustained. North Korea is in breach of numerous UN Security Council resolutions. As American presidents go, he's obviously the wild joker in the pack. A pragmatic policy with China based on Australian national interests. To ban all foreign donations to Australian political parties. And just legislate and fix this up. Private conversations of climate scientists, they are deeply worried about it. Not to put that on the agenda and have a discussion uh, would be uh, intolerable for me as an Australian. And welcome to our panellists and everyone who's joined us this evening for what promises to be a very interesting and topical discussion. I think we all agree that Australia has done better than many other countries in managing the pandemic. And a key part of our success has been controlling our borders. We closed them in March last year to non-citizens and non-residents, and we've kept them shut tightly ever since. But tens of thousands of Australians are still stranded overseas waiting to come home. And for a brief period, it was even a criminal offence for Australian citizens to try and return home from India. So. Have we struck the right balance in terms of preventing the spread of the virus in Australia while fulfilling our responsibilities to Australians abroad? And Norman, I'll invite you to respond to this first. Ryan, I, you know, about you know, March of last year, or maybe a little bit later, maybe this time last year, I did a paper looking at just the, the number of infections that were prevented by us shutting down uh, at the end of January. We only shut down to China then, and, um, and it took us a while to actually go to full um, border closure. Um, look, it, it has made a huge difference to the control of the pandemic, um, as well as internal internal procedures. The problem is one of is humanitarian, and we um, have not taken a risk managed approach, which we probably could have. To some countries, um, we've been very conservative in that approach. Part of the problem is we don't have a fit for purpose hotel quarantine system, despite the. Um, protestations by some premiers and the prime minister that we have a fantastic hotel quarantine system because we've only had a few leaks, uh, escapes, compared to the, what is it, 300 or 1,000 people who've come through. But that's not the denominator. So work by New Zealand researchers and Tony Blakely at the University of Melbourne have actually done the, the work which looks at the actual real statistic about how many leaks there have been relative to the number of people who've gotten infected with SARS-CoV-2 coming to the country. And that's one in 172 thereabouts. So it's actually quite a high rate. We don't have, and so opening our borders does mean that we would get leaks into the communities in our non-immune population. And unlike many of the countries from people watching now, we've had high rates, but even there, you've got a relatively small proportion of the population immunized. So there's a lot of people who could get infected and we could get a dreadful outbreak. So vaccination is the way out of that. And unfortunately, our government has stuffed up vaccination. They stuffed up procurement. Um, they uh, were offered Pfizer vaccines back in June of last year, 2020. How much do you want? When do you want it? And the Pfizer was treated dismissively and went away. Um, and as a result, we did not... The, 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 what the government told us was that they had four different vaccines as backup. They didn't have four vaccines as backup. They were relying on the University of Queensland and the Astra vaccine, and they did not have full backup. They should have bought 40 million doses of Pfizer as full backup, just in case one of the others fell over. They didn't do that. And they also um, were incompetent at how they, how they rolled out the vaccine program. Truly, it's incompetence. And the closer you get into it, you realise that. We have in Australia, for the overseas viewers, a very established system of distributing vaccines, um, which is well tried and true. We are a high immunizing country, but they bypassed that. One of the excuses was Pfizer and the need for cold storage, but even that could have been got wrong. And so they, our, our rollout has been uh, quite frankly appalling and they blame supply, but that was really only a temporary blip. We've, we've had plenty of supply of Astra. It's Pfizer that we're running short of. Um, but they're promising full vaccination by the end of the year, which is the promise of opening up even then. 
Um, but that would require probably 400,000 doses a day, which would be probably double America and the United Kingdom at their best. So um, the, the problem is how we get there and what controls we have in place when we get there. Thanks, Norman. Uh, we'll come back to the vaccine rollout shortly. Um, but first, I'd just like you to um, expand a little bit on what you think a risk management approach would look like um, if we were to take one. You said that before that um, Australia hasn't taken a risk management approach. What, what, what could we expect to see if that was adopted? Well, I think Mike and Ryan are probably more, not probably, 100% more qualified than me to talk about that. But briefly, it's it's what I talked about. It's identifying, and this is no this is no there are no guarantees on this one, um, and it's hard to it's hard to manage. But you could look at countries which have very low rates of transmission, have got good controls in place, and have not got much virus circulating, and pretty much like the bubble we've got with New Zealand. And, uh, and then open up, and you could open up cautiously, um, but we've got to have um, high levels of vaccination to do it, you know, to do it to a larger number of, the, you know, Singapore could be next, but a larger number of, of, of countries. We've got to have good quarantine in place. We've got to have disadvantaged populations covered with vaccines, and we've got to have high rates of vaccination so, so that you've got as much protection as you can get, particularly amongst the elderly in Australia, so if it does get out, it's not going to do much damage. But what will come to mug us are the variants. So the variants we see now are not necessarily the variants we're going to see at the end of the year. How virulent are they going to be? How contagious are they going to be? And how vaccine resistant are they going to be? We actually don't know that at the moment. And as more of the world gets vaccinated, the potential is that you get more mutants that are spinning around the, uh, the, the vaccines and resisting them more. Those are all the variables that make this a very difficult thing to predict and model. But you know, Mike comes from the Burnett and they're doing some modelling on this as we speak. Thanks very much, Norman. Raina, is it possible to speed up the return of Australian citizens and residents safely? And what would it take for this to happen? I think it is possible um, if we had enough quarantine capacity. The other thing we could do is vaccinate people at their origin. So if that could be organised, you know, either through local providers or if it was organised through Australian embassies, um, vaccinate people first and then bring them back into uh, dedicated quarantine facilities. We did it right at the beginning uh, when people were evacuated from Wuhan. Um, and in that case, Christmas Island was used. Um, so I think it is possible if there was adequate uh, capacity. The problem is the capacity. It's also a disproportionate burden on New South Wales and Victoria because that's where the majority of international travellers come into. So I think with additional support for those two states, it's, it's possible. Well, I think I agree with what Raina said. Um, and we can't do that safely unless we have first better quarantine and a, a larger capacity. Um, <clears throat> and over the course of the last six months, we've had 18 separate leaks in hotel quarantine in five mainland capital cities. And that's not counting the as yet um, unclarified uh, issue of how the Delta variant um, arrived in Melbourne. So, of course, for me, it's a no brainer to develop fit for purpose facilities like uh, Howard Springs, because that's the only mainland city that hasn't had a leak and it has the ideal conditions for hotel for, for quarantine. Um, but even if the governments or the federal government agreed to build such a facility in every state and territory, that's not going to happen for six months. So, you know, since November, we've had a, a breach uh, every 11 days on average. And I see no reason why that won't continue because I don't see any attempt at continual improvement in the system. Um, it's really a hodgepodge at the moment. Every state, I've looked at all the states and everyone is different. You know, some states have done ventilation audits and then improved ventilation in rooms. Others have not even bothered to do an audit. Some states provide the very best respiratory masks, like N95 or P2, to their hotel staff. Others don't. 
some you know still even employ private security guards who can have second jobs and remember the firestorm about victoria doing that last year so there's no real common um code of practice for hotel quarantine so i can't see us taking more um travelers or opening our borders until that that's fixed because as norman said uh, vaccines aren't going to protect us for at least another six to nine months so we have to, to keep the virus out we have to you know, improve the system thank you mike why do you think we've been so slow to move towards purpose-built quarantine facilities like the howard springs facility I think, uh, Deb, it's entirely political. That is, um, the Commonwealth Government succeeded in persuading the states to take responsibility for quarantine initially. And so it was seen as a state responsibility with the state choosing the hotels and so on. Uh, once it became apparent that there were, that the states were prepared to do that for the first six months, nine months, and then I think they realised the difficulty of this and they tried to get the Commonwealth to be engaged. They tried to get the Commonwealth to um, invest in purpose-built quarantine facilities like the Howard Springs one. Of course, the Commonwealth didn't want to be engaged in hotel quarantine for exactly the same reasons uh, that they shifted it off to the states. That is, it was only a downside for them because in any human system, especially a system where the the hotels were not purpose-built, where, where, where transmission was occurring within hotels, where there were leakage from the hotel system with the staffing and so on. It was entirely political downside for the Commonwealth, and so they tried to avoid having any responsibility for as long as possible. Eventually that became not uh, feasible, and so they ended up having to accept that they will have to put up some money for purpose-built quarantine uh, given what we now know about transmission of the virus. Thank you, Stephen. Norman, would you like to add some comments to that? Well, overlaid on that is the quality of expert advice that's come from the federal government and appears to have been accepted by some of the states through the, principal, the, the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee. Um, and the quality of advice they've got has been, quite frankly, appalling. They have a group called the Infection Control Expert Group who are nice people, uh, clever people. They're very good at controlling MRSA in, in hospitals. Some of them know something about flu. There's only one person who's a recent arrival on that committee who actually knows about ventilation and aerosol spread. But they have been operating, and Ryan, you know, Ryan has been talking about this for 14 or 15 months. They've been operating on evidence from the 1940s that this is, air, that this is droplet spread um, within one and a half meters, which clearly does happen, but the that there is a very dominant spread. There's a dominant spread for, through fine aerosols in the air, and they've resisted that. And therefore, the assumption is that um, you don't need to wear N95 masks. You don't need to protect yourself that well. We still have guidelines in hospitals if you're treating a COVID-19 patient. Although I haven't seen the guidelines that came out today, um, that you don't need to wear an N95 mask. That resulted in a medical registrar getting infected in Queensland. And the, you know, a lockdown in Queensland and the Bar and Bay Blues Festival cancelled from from a national guideline through uh, inexpert, inadequate advice. Um, I also hear that the one of the reasons why Pfizer was treated so dismissively is that some of these so-called experts, with no experience in vaccines really, um, were advising the government that mRNA was not going to be a viable technology. And um, the government was listening to them, and they've refused to really renovate that. And so we've been behind the eight ball, and they've hidden behind the skirts of uh, WHO and CDC, who've also been a bit down on aerosol spread. So we've, we've, we're lucky we've done so well with such poor advice at a national level. Raina, why do you think it's taken us so long to recognise the risks of aerosol transmission? I remember in the first half of last year, we were very focused on surface transmission as um, the kind of secondary transmission route after um, respiratory droplets. Uh, and now it seems that surface transmission plays a much lesser role than, than aerosol transmission. What are the main transmission routes that we need to be concerned about um, 
for the current strains of the virus that we're seeing emerging in Australia now? So for all of it, really, it's the air we breathe that matters the most. And unfortunately, there's been an industry generated in what's been aptly termed hygiene theatre, which is, you know, scrubbing surfaces, washing hands, um, putting up plexiglass barriers, which really don't do much at all because it's an impermeable barrier. And every bank you walk into or um, shopping centre, um, customer service type roles, supermarkets, you see these plexiglass barriers, you know, but it's the air we breathe. So the air just moves around following the, the airflow pattern as you inhale and you inhale it. So really face masks have been um, one of the most important mitigation measures as well as ventilation. Um, and it's taken a long time globally really to recognise that, uh, which is um, why it's taken so long here. Um, WHO only acknowledged airborne transmission in June last year after a letter led by leading scientists in the world, led by Lydia Morawska, who's an Australian um, from Queensland, who's a, a world-renowned um, aerosol scientist. Um, and in response to that letter, WHO finally acknowledged airborne transmission. Um, the CDC as well, um, you know, at the beginning, you might remember WHO, CDC, everyone was issuing messages saying, do not wear a mask. It's actually dangerous for your health. It might harm you. And then it sort of softened to it might give you acne. Um, well, you know, I don't mind getting acne if it's going to prevent me from dying. Um, so we had this narrative and it still really influences people you know you still see the plexiglass barriers the obsessive hand washing the sanitizers everywhere when really and nobody's wearing a mask you know you go into the shopping center nobody's wearing a mask so it's had an unfortunate psychological effect on people it's, they've had that message drilled into them wash your hands and sing happy birthday twice We've just got to undo that and convey the messaging about the air you breathe is what matters the most. If you're having guests over, open a window. If you're driving in a car with other people that you don't know, open a window. Um, that's going to make all the difference. So uh, we need to change that messaging. And uh, actually, Norman, the guidelines that came out today were uh, actually quite good. They've acknowledged... Um, aerosol spread and recommended N95 respirators for health workers. Um, I haven't read them in full, but uh, hopefully that means for hotel quarantine as well. Thank you, Raina. Um, while you're there, can you tell us um, a little bit about the um, transmissibility of the new variants that we've been seeing in Victoria, the Kappa and Delta variants that emerged in India, um, and whether there are any particular issues that we should be concerned about regarding um, transmission. So the Delta variant is the most transmissible of all the variants of concern that have emerged. Prior to that, it was the Alpha, which is the UK variant. That in itself was 50 to 100% more transmissible than the virus that caused the Victorian second wave. So the Delta is estimated to be 60% more transmissible than Alpha. So it's super, super contagious. Um, probably also um, it means that people may be infectious for longer. Uh, the amount of virus they shed from their respiratory tract um, is probably higher so that um, someone who's been through a shop or some closed environment who's infected, those infected aerosols might be higher in concentration, might pose a greater risk. Um, the data is still emerging, but uh, we've seen a lot of analysis out of the UK, which has had uh, where the Delta strain has taken over basically from the Alpha. Um, the Kappa is also more contagious, but not as contagious as the Delta, but it's more contagious than the Alpha. Um, both of them have um, some vaccine resistance as well. Um, the Kappa probably more, but there's a lot less data on the Kappa, but just based on the genetic um, mutations in the Kappa, um, it may be more vaccine resistant than the Delta. For the Delta, we know that one dose of Pfizer or AstraZeneca 
um, this is from the UK, will give you about 33% protection. Um, and then that raises up to six, about 60% for AstraZeneca, about 88% for Pfizer after two doses. <coughs> so partially vaccinated people have made up a lot of the outbreaks that are happening in the UK at the moment. And that's an issue when you've got to wait three months for, to be fully vaccinated. Thanks very much, Raina. Um, Mike, do you have anything that you'd like to add about the transmissibility of the new variants uh, and how responsive they are to vaccines? No, I, I um, concur with the, the data that Raina described. Um, I think another issue, of course, is that if we allow the virus to continue to spread um, around the world, there are you know, very high risks of further mutations um, that may be, you know, may evade the immune response by vaccines even more. And we know, actually, it's the um, the gamma uh, variant, or what was called P1 in Brazil, which is the variant that evades immunity um, by vaccines more than any of the other uh, variants of concern. Um, fortunately, we haven't had that circulate in Australia. Um, there's a fair bit of argument among virologists uh, about whether the virus actually has the capacity to, to continue to mutate. But I think the jury's out, and I think we, we should expect at least one or two more mutations that give the virus um, an advantage and make it fitter, as we say, um, to spread and maybe cause more severe illness. Um, I think the fact that the Delta and also the Gamma variants are infecting children more than the earlier variants and the original Wuhan strain is of great concern. Um, I just read today about a surge in child deaths in Brazil from, from the Gamma variant. Um, and we've seen this in Canada, in, in lots of places, the UK, Bolton right now. Um, so if the virus expands its reach into populations that we're not yet confident to vaccinate, though I think we will be soon, um, that just expands the, the, the risks ahead. Thanks, Mike. So at the moment, Australia's um, relying very heavily on the AstraZeneca vaccine, which of course we're making onshore, um, and the Pfizer vaccine for people aged under 50. Um, is, uh, is this mix of vaccines going to be adequate um, in the face of, of these vaccines? Obviously, we have, um, we've have we also pre-ordered doses of the Moderna vaccine and the Novavax vaccine, um, which will hopefully come later in the year. But at the moment, um, we've just got AstraZeneca and Pfizer. How's that going to go with these new variants? Um, perhaps I might ask uh, Norman to comment on this first. Um, well, I'll stand to be corrected by Ryan and Mike, but the um, so Astra is not as effective. As, so so the, the, the data that Ryan just spoke about, 60% effect, efficacy from the UK data on a Delta, um, which is only a few percent less than, the, than otherwise would have been to the British variant, the 117, the Alpha. Now, we were promised on a 12-week gap between vaccines about 80% effectiveness um, for the Astra vaccine. What we're getting there is 60%, which is actually what they got in the clinical trials with a four-week gap. Some virologists are saying, oh, well, um, it's, there's a slow burn with Astra, which may well be true, and you'll see the immunity growing. And also, we haven't got as much data for Astra because it, it does take three months, and therefore there's more with Pfizer because it's, you know, there's you've got more fully immunized people to Pfizer, and therefore you've got more data. But um, I think that given that we've got Astra, it may well be makes sense to actually shorten the interval between doses, maybe even shorter than eight weeks, which is what we've been talking about. Because we're only getting percent in 12 weeks. You might as well just do it four weeks apart, because that's what you got in the clinical trial. So I'm not quite sure why anymore we're waiting for 12 weeks. Um, and then I think... Um, it depends on the vaccine on the vaccine resistance of the other ones. It turns out that if you mix Astra and Pfizer, you almost certainly get a larger um, neutralizing antibody response than you do with two Pfizer doses, for example. So a, a booster strategy later in the year could well 
bring you up and even exceed the immunity you get with two, two Pfizer doses. There's lots of things that you could do. I'm not confident, by the way, that we've got the flexibility in our system to be able to adjust to that. Um, it's, we seem to take a long time to make decisions, be very risk averse. But there, there are ways through this. Um, which will protect the, the, the population well. And you could just, rather than waiting till the end of the year for Pfizer, where we're going to be, you're going to be behind, at the back of the queue behind 12-year-olds, get covered to some extent now, and it's going to be much easier to give people a single Pfizer booster towards the end of the year. The Novavax looks as if it could be a really good vaccine. It could also be a combined flu COVID-19 vaccine, um, and that will be a very welcome addition to the table. Thanks very much, Norman. Raina, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think um, despite a slow start, I think about 20% of people, Australians, have had their first dose, um, <coughs> less the second dose because of that gap. So that'll take a little bit of time to catch up. And the same thing was observed when you compared the UK and the US. So they, the UK actually started with the first dose rates higher than the US's first dose race, rates, but for complete vaccination, the US overtook the UK because there was three weeks between doses compared to three months. So when you're having outbreaks and disease, that does make a difference, especially if it's variants where one dose really doesn't give you that much protection. One dose certainly gives you good protection against um, the, the alpha or the UK variant. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think the situation will change towards the end of the year, but I think as Mike, Mike said earlier on, we're really going to have to rely on our quarantine system being improved to ensure that we stay safe till, until that time that we can have most people vaccinated. And the vaccination of children is the other question. So <clears throat> I still believe it's theoretically possible to achieve herd immunity through vaccination if we vaccinate enough people. But I think it's because of the variants are so much more contagious, we probably that we probably can't achieve it without vaccinating at least children over 12. So that's a discussion. I believe um, Atagi and so on are considering that. We'll hear more about it um, sometime soon. Um, but it's something that needs to be on the table and um, being looked at. Thank you. So, so is herd immunity something that we should still be aiming for, Raina? Yeah, absolutely. That's the that's the ultimate goal. You know, we have achieved herd immunity for measles, which is much more contagious than the Delta variant. We've achieved uh, herd immunity for polio, both through vaccination. So, it is theoretically possible to achieve it for SARS-CoV-2. Um, there's been a lot of pessimism and naysaying, but there was too about us having a vaccine. A lot of people last year were saying we may never have a COVID vaccine. So I think it's always good to aim high um, in terms of economic recovery. There's been a number of studies that have shown um, that uh, if you use, if you go for a low goal and have low efficacy vaccines, you barely break even economically over a 10 year period. Um, but you do come out ahead if you use high efficacy vaccines and if you achieve herd immunity. So I think those differences are really going to play out into the future um, for us economically. Thanks very much. I'd like to focus a little bit more now on the issues around the um, the, the vaccination rollout at the, the national level. Um, so as people have mentioned, we got off to a really slow start with our, our vaccination program. The federal government's original targets were to administer 4 million vaccines by the end of March and to have the adult population, around 20 million people, vaccinated by the end of October. But 15 weeks on, um, we're up to having administered 5.5 million doses um, with approximately one in five <laughs> Australians having received their first dose. And I think it's becoming clearer that it will be into 2022 by the time um, all adults have had the opportunity to be fully vaccinated. Um, one of the big issues, of course, has been the vaccine rollout in aged care facilities, uh, which was 
part of priority group 1A and that was expected to take around six weeks and conclude around the end of March. Um, but by the time I received my first vaccine dose on the 14th of May as part of priority group 2A, um, my mother, who was living in aged care, hadn't received hers. Um, so, Stephen, I'm wondering if you could walk us through um, some of the issues, some of the obstacles around the um, federal government's vaccine strategy, um, which you referred to recently as an expensive shambles. Can you tell us a bit about that? And also as a train wreck, Deb. Um, so, basically, the... The Commonwealth's political strategy right from the start was to see this as a Commonwealth rollout of vaccines. They were spending a lot of money on vaccines. They wanted to get a lot of credit for it, slapping the Liberal Party logo on their announcements. To, to have a Commonwealth strategy, it had to be through Commonwealth channels, and in particular through GPs, pharmacies, and specially contracted people. So what, in the case of aged care, they contracted a number of um, private companies uh, to take responsibility for the rollout, uh, for the rollout to uh, aged care facilities. And they separately contracted to um, logistics companies to deliver the vaccines. And more or less, whatever could go wrong went wrong. So you ended up, in the case of aged care facilities, with vaccines turning up at one place and the teams to do the vaccination turning up another place. And so there was this disconnect with how the whole system was working. Not only that, but in the initial announcements, the promise was that not only would aged care residents be vaccinated, but so too would be the aged care workers. Uh, but as it turned out, some of the contracts with these contractors actually didn't include vaccination of the aged care workers. And the message from the Commonwealth was our priority is not the workers, our priority is the residents. Well, even if their priority was the residents, that was that just didn't happen. It, it went very, very slowly. So the logistics, the delivery, the organisation was completely a train wreck. Contrast that with a different strategy they could have had. What they could have said was to the states, you've got these area health services all around the country. We want you to take responsibility for your own healthcare workers, for the quarantine workers, but also for aged care workers, disability workers, residents of aged care facilities and residents of disability facilities, all in stage 1A. And so they could have structured it that way uh, with the the area health services taking responsibility for those vulnerable groups in their communities, they didn't. And we've seen that in the results of the very, very low rollout amongst uh, aged care residents. And who knows what the rollout is amongst aged care workers because there's been no tracking of that. Thanks, Stephen. So to what extent do you think these were just kind of teething issues or hiccups in the initial rollout? And to what extent do you see um, the problems still in place and perhaps threatening the rollout going forward? Well, the real issue, Deb, is how long should teething issues last? So we were slow off the mark in getting the vaccination rollout started. Now, I was not critical of that, in fact, uh, because I assumed that they were actually getting the rollout planned and, and once it started, it was going to go smoothly and the targets would go, were going to be met. Well, as it turned out, we were both slow in getting started and disorganised in getting started. And so we're, we're now uh, into June and it doesn't look to me as if the, the rollout is, in, is markedly better from what it was back in March. That is, we've still got disorganisation in the aged care sector. We still don't know how many aged care workers are being vaccinated and what the, who is responsible for that and how they're going to do it. And so it doesn't look to me like we've, we've got over the teething phase, even though we should have actually got rid of our deciduous te teeth in terms of vaccination now and be on to the real thing, and we're just not. 
Thanks, Stephen. I wonder if, Mike, you might like to, to add to um, Stephen's comments. And I'm particularly interested in how much um, you see the issues with the the local vaccine rollout as being related to the supply of vaccines versus issues in the health system in Australia? Um, look, I just checked the New York Times vaccination tracker. Australia still ranks number 81 in the world for first doses. Um, we're way behind countries like Mongolia, Cambodia, um, etc. So I think it's, you know, it's been a a combination of supply and demand issues. Um, clearly, the supply problem is related to our very slow decision making last year in deciding what vaccines and how much we should we should order. So we ended up with a very narrow set of options. Uh, we've only got two. Um, now, one couldn't have been anticipated. That was the failure of the um, Queensland. Um, vaccine, and we couldn't have anticipated the um, rare but serious um, side effects of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which has lowered, uh, of course, um, vaccine demand and, and increased hesitancy. So we're really in a bit of a tight spot at the moment, and I think the next three months are going to be very difficult for Australia. We will continue to have just two options. Um, we don't have a very large um, input or continuous supply of Pfizer. I think we heard today from the um, commander at the, the um, national level that you know, we're getting about 100,000 or so a week. We have a lot more AstraZeneca because it's produced locally, but we don't give that to under 50s and a lot of over 50s don't want it. Um, I can't see things accelerating until the fourth quarter. And that's, of course, only if what we've been promised we get. And that will be 30 million doses of Pfizer, 10, millions of, 10 million doses of Moderna, and hopefully um, a couple of million of Novavax, which, as Norman said, is a very promising vaccine. So I, I think it's, it's just going to be tight. Um, I agree with Stephen that the Commonwealth should never have taken this on operationally. They've never done anything like this. Um, they've never run a hospital, let alone a vaccination campaign. Um, they should have taken on responsibility for deciding on which vaccines to get, procurement, distribution. Um, and even then, uh, they can't produce um, a day-by-day -day inventory. You know, I've run small programs in, back in refugee camps where I or my pharmacy assistant could tell me on any one day how many doses I've got of each type of drug and vaccine, how many I can expect next week and the week after. We don't seem to be able to do that in Australia. So it makes planning very difficult. And the other big barrier to accelerating our uptake of vaccination is the really poor quality of communications by the national government. You know, I I turn on my TV and I see this doctor with a stethoscope and I just turn off. I just feel so bored. I think there's another one with an equally boring nurse. I mean, surely in this country, we have the expertise, um, the creativity to develop, you know, um, communications that really grab your attention and deliver clear, accurate, evidence-based messages. And they may need to be um, targeted at different groups. You know, we know that early on, young women were very hesitant, uh, and now it's over 50s. So I think, you know, we, we've this combination of non-transparent um, communication about supplies and a very poor quality of communication about the need for vaccination is really holding us back. And of course, going back to the poor choices we made last year. Thanks, Mike. Um, Norman, what are your thoughts about how the communication around the vaccination program could be improved? 
Um, well, Mike's absolutely right. Um, we have some of the best creative advertising people in the world, and they've clearly not been allowed to do their stuff. Um, and it's embarrassing. And as Mike said, for those who live overseas watching us, uh, it has literally been that. Um, a couple of doctors with the stethoscope around their neck and the head of the TGA in a white coat telling us everything's going to be okay, just get the vaccine. They're not really addressing the issues. And, um, you know, when you look at the New Zealand campaign for the vaccine, the ad looks like New Zealand. It's South Pacific, you know, Pacific Islanders, it's Maori, it's uh, uh, Anglo-New Zealanders. It's, you know, in all, in all its energy. Um, the Singaporean one is very funny and, uh, and very, very Singaporean. And uh, the British, very amusing. Uh, you know, this creative campaigns to, dis to really focus on what you are actually going to gain out of having this vaccine rather than a somber one, which assumes there's some negativity in there. And, uh, you know, it's okay. You just need your Medicare care card and you'll be fine. So what we've got to do is target and what... One of the, and there is a lot of vaccine hesitancy in non-English speaking cultures or cultures where English might not be the first language in Aboriginal communities in Australia and uh, a lot of misinformation going around. And the assumption has been since, since the beginning of this pandemic is that those, those communities watch the state premiers giving their press conferences every day and watch uh, the ABC. They don't. Um, they have their alternate means of communication. That was one of the problems in the second wave in Victoria, is that the Victorian government was very ineffective at communicating with co communities, uh, diverse, very diverse communities in the northwest corridor of Melbourne. And what they had to do was actually go out and walk the streets and get uh, community leaders. It's a very different way of communicating with diverse communities. Aboriginal people have got to talk to Aboriginal people. You've got to use elders. Um, we've got to get out of the way of Aboriginal communities. Community-controlled health organisations in Australia did a magnificent job of controlling the pandemic and not getting any leak into communities, endangering their elders. We've got to use all those different sources, and it's not necessarily all just paying an ad agency to do a nice creative ad, which is going to be necessary. But we've got to, we've got there's a lot of different kinds of communication from trusted sources, and um, that requires community engagement. Thank you. It'd be good to talk a little bit about the um, the international issues around um, COVID-19. And of course, we're seeing uh, COVID-19 cases surging across countries in Asia uh, and Africa at the moment. And in the last few months, we've seen some concerning outbreaks in countries um, close to home, like Papua New Guinea and Indonesia, for example. And Australia's made some donations of both money and vaccines. So, for example, we've donated $130 million now to COVAX, the global program for distributing um, vaccines equitably to lo and particularly to low-income countries. Um, and we've made donations of tens of thousands of vaccine doses to countries like Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste and Fiji. But on the other hand, we've now pre-purchased enough doses to vaccinate our entire population approximately three times over, while low-income countries are largely missing out. And only 0.3% of doses administered so far around the world have been in low-income countries. And until yesterday, Australia was one of a handful of countries that was stalling negotiations at the World Trade Organization about a proposal to waive intellectual property rights for COVID-19 medical products, including vaccines, treatments and diagnostic tools. Um, so fortunately, Australia's um, shifted its position just recently um, on this important proposal to increase the global supply of COVID-19 medical products and to enable more of these products to be made in low and middle income countries. But how well overall has Australia fulfilled its obligations to other countries and particularly to our neighbours in the Asia Pacific? And how could we do better? I might put this question first to Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Deb. Well, if I could start by um, describing the four or five ways 
that the world, including Australia, can increase access by the world equitably to vaccines. And I think the first is financial commitments to COVAX, the global um, facility to distribute uh, vaccines to poor countries. Australia has done that. I'm not sure if they made a, a, a new commitment at the recent um, donor conference. The second is, um, well, if I might say, um, the US administration, to their credit, has actually taken on each of these four or five methods that I'll describe. Um, the second is direct donations. So we heard that the Biden administration will provide 500 million doses of Pfizer, and they will do that through COVAX. So they're not following the Russian and Chinese model of bilateral donations. They're doing it through a multilateral um, mechanism, and I congratulate them for that. The third, of course, is for calling uh, for a waiver on vaccine patents. And there are now about 100 countries in the world supporting that, which is the 100 members of the WTO. Uh, America supports that. And Australia now is kind of lukewarm supporting it. Uh, a fourth way is that um, is, is strengthening um, manufacturing capacity um, around the world. And you'll recall in March, the Quad meeting of Japan, India, Australia, and the US did make a commitment to provide 1 billion extra doses to um, the Indo-Pacific region, mainly through um, ramping up uh, manufacturing. And that was initially to be in Japan, India, and South Korea. And Australia will provide logistics support to the tune of $100 million. So there, I think, most of the, the mechanisms that we can use to, to boost availability. Coming back to Australia, as, as Deb has said, we have made some commitments to um, provide 10,000 doses of AstraZeneca weekly to Melanesian countries. We did contribute to Quad, to COVAX, um, and we did provide PNG with some um, doses of AstraZeneca. I think, you know, I just recently uh, on this webinar said that we're going to be in a tight spot in the next three months for vaccinating Australians. But um, I predict that we will have a, a surplus supply of AstraZeneca. So I think during the next three months, we could gradually ramp up that contribution of AstraZeneca from 10,000 weekly to 20, 30, 40, you know, way higher. Then when we get to this abundance of riches that we've been promised in the, th the fourth quarter, we could basically give uh, away most of our AstraZeneca and some of these Pfizer, Moderna and Novavax vaccines. So we should have a plan for that. You know, we should be really, you know, I just said we don't have a very good inventory system. If we could improve our inventory and more accurately predict what we need of each vaccine to vaccinate Australians, then we can then say, okay, we've got X um, number of doses of AstraZeneca, we might have Y doses of Pfizer, and maybe even Z um, doses of Novavax. And we should be planning for that. Um, but that's not saying that those other mechanisms I, mechan I, I, I um, mentioned are not important. Going back to the, the waiver of the vaccine patent, and I think Deb knows, I have one concern about that, is that if there is a patent waiver, if the vaccine manufacturers are stubborn, they may just share the, the recipe, the basic recipe. That won't help, for example, the Serum Institute of India to manufacture Pfizer or Moderna. They need to know how to manufacture this vaccine. Now, Pfizer has 230 different basic ingredients in the process of making that vaccine. And they need to share that, and a lot of that is not patented, it's just commercial and confidence. They need to share that. And my wish would be that the wealthy countries of the world 
pressure their manufacturers, particularly the European Union, to have a voluntary um, licensing agreement with countries like India, Thailand, Philippines, Cuba, etc., that already have the capacity to produce vaccines. Thanks, Mike. Um, so on the issue of um, donating vaccines, um, I'm wondering what the other panellists think about are we, are we doing enough um, in terms of, of donating vaccines, donating funds um, for purchasing vaccines? And is it, a, is it enough to wait until um, we've got a decent vaccination rate in Australia or do we need to be ramping that up now? If we, if we wait until we've, we've va achieved herd immunity in Australia or we've you know, vaccinated a certain percentage of our population, what are the, some of the risks around that? Raina, would you like to comment on that? Well, I mean, I agree with everything that Mike said, um, that we should be doing all those things. Um, it is possible, you know, um, we've got the AstraZeneca being manufactured onshore, so it is possible to both get our vaccination rates up high and still keep supplying the region. But I also think it's, it is a bit like putting on your oxygen mask first before uh, putting it on your child or someone else because um, if we have, you know, poor control of, you know, outbreaks caused by new variants in Australia, that's not, that's going to leave, uh, you know, mean that our resources will be then diverted inwardly. We are in a better position to help the region um, if, if we've got everyone protected in Australia or most people. So should we go to the, the point of vaccinating children where, when uh, other countries perhaps haven't vaccinated their more vulnerable groups, health workers, uh, older people, uh, people who are, are likely to, to need hospitalisation if they catch the virus? Well, I do think so with these variants like Delta. They're causing outbreaks in children and it looks like it's actually causing comparatively more severe disease in children um, you know it is taxpayer funding so I think there would be a public expectation that um, you know we protect our children um, first but I think we do have domestic manufacturing capacity we're now looking at starting mRNA manufacturing capacity in Australia and I think that's the ideal position to get to where um, Australia is a hub for the region in manufacturing. You know, there's only about a dozen countries in the world that have vaccine manufacturing capacity. So we could really scale that up so that we can be in a position to supply the region. Um, that's good for us. It's good for disease control. In the end, if it's not controlled globally, it's going to be, you know, a problem for everyone in an ongoing way. Thank you. Yes, I think it's really clear that we need to really ramp up the manufacturing at, at the global level. And, you know, there's quite a bit of unused um, manufacturing capacity in Asia, Latin America um, and uh, Africa, that countries where a lot of the, the world's supply of vaccines uh, have been manufactured in, in the past. Um, well, can I just interrupt and make one it? comment, Deb? Can I just make one comment about that? So India is actually the world's largest vaccine manufacturer, but they had such a severe epidemic, and this is my point about putting on your oxygen mask first. They had such a severe epidemic that they could not supply their own population, let alone all the countries in South Asia and in Africa that were relying on Indian vaccines. So all those other countries have now stopped getting doses and they've got people who are partially vaccinated, they can't finish their vaccination schedule. So that's why it's important to control things. You know, you've got to think of it as a precious resource when you've got vaccine manufacturing capability and everything around that has to be protected so that it can function maximally. Thank you. Um, Stephen, do you have any comments to add to that? No, it's as I think Rana said, it's in our interest to make sure these nearby countries are vaccinated because their variants can be created where there's high level of um, transmission. 
Thank you. Um, so we'll be moving to Q&A um, from the audience shortly, but I've got one more question to put to the panellists first. What have we learnt about how to handle this pandemic and how to handle future pandemics? Um, Stephen, would you like to address this first? Well, it's one of the interesting things for me is we're not entirely sure how long vaccine uh, protection will last and will we have to have a booster shot in one year or two years' time. And so, you know, what what is our policy going to be about vaccination rollouts for some future pandemic and even for this uh, virus uh, if we do need a booster shot? And what we need to say is step back and say, well, what we did this time was hopelessly wrong. Let's go back to immunising the way we've done flu or the, the way the English have done it or whatever. But we need to actually step back and look at what went wrong this time for what we ought to be doing into the future. Thank you. Mike, what's your perspective on what we've learnt about how to, how to handle pandemics from our experience so far with COVID? I think at this moment we need uh, what I'd call a vaccine plus strategy. We've you know, seen all the evidence that the world is not going to be vaccinated at least until the end of next year. And Australia probably won't be vaccinated until well into next year. So in the meantime, we need to apply all the lessons we've learned to prevent transmission um, in the absence of vaccines. You know, we just pretend we're not vaccinated. Um, and I think it's been disappointing that some so-called experts, and Stephen and, well, Norman um, referred to those in, in Australia, have not been willing to learn from the evidence and modify their policies. And of course, aerosol transmission is the kind of gold medalist in, in that category. Um, many of our so-called experts are stuck with a dogma um, that originated actually earlier than Norman said, uh, it was actually in the 1920s, um, that respiratory infections are spread by these large droplets. And it also, interestingly, uh, was compounded by an error made by a former CDC director, US CDC director, just after the war, where he actually misread his notes. And from that, this mantra of particles are either less than five microns or greater than five microns um, in size. And then that just became embedded in the dogma. So I think people need to really be much more open to the evidence and therefore adapt their policies so that we can, in parallel with rolling out the vaccine, be much better at preventing and controlling outbreaks of this virus. Thank you. And finally, I'll ask Raina for her comments on what we've learned from COVID-19. I think um, there's three things, three big ticket items. One is that a lot of the problems that need solving around a pandemic are not health problems. And unless you have multidisciplinary expertise at the table, you'll just have a bunch of, bunch of health people who don't have the requisite knowledge to solve the problem. Um, that includes with the airborne transmission, for example, you need engineers, aerosol scientists, you know, building experts, kind of expertise that were not at the table. Um, but on a broader level as well, it's around logistics and operations and how you get things, um, supplies, um, manufacturing, um, you know, how you, how you pivot um, manufacturing to meet demand in medical supplies, things like ventilators, masks, etc. cetera. Um, the second thing I think is that, you know, the, if, we've, if there are operational health tasks, let the states do it, empower them, give them the funding and let them do it because that's what they do. The states and territories manage all operational health care, including vaccination. The Commonwealth's traditional role in vaccination is procurement of the vaccines. They have not been involved in 
operations of delivering vaccines. And that's where I think we had some problems. If at the get go, um, that everything had been handed to the states and the states had been tasked with doing it, I think we'd be a long way ahead. And we've seen a bit of frustration between the states and Commonwealth on that. So I think, you know, recognise that the states have all the operational expertise and infrastructure. You know, I think we saw <clears throat> GPs, for example, shut out on a number of levels when they're the ones who deliver our national immunisation program, but it was made harder for them. You know, vaccine supply was re restricted very tightly for them. Um, you know, in my own GP practice, they still haven't got the vaccine and can't tell us when they're getting it. So it was made really hard for GPs when they're actually the backbone of our of our um, structure. If it had been left to the states, I think the states understand that it would have worked better. And the final thing is about quarantine. You know, quarantine is a federal responsibility. Uh, till the 1980s, we did have quarantine, uh, qu quarantine centres, including the one at Sydney. Um, and maybe it's time to think about um, how we would deal with this kind of situation in the future. We do have an advantage being an island. Um, even in the 1918 pandemic, we kept it at bay for a year compared to the rest of the world. And when it did come here, it was less severe. Um, so we do have a geographical advantage and <clears throat> we should be thinking about that because the risk of emerging infections is increasing. We should have some really good models ready to go. So I know in China they've got a scale up, scale down model where they've got particular hospitals or buildings and models for quarantine that can be scaled up rapidly and then scaled down and repurposed as required. So we really need to think about that. Um, so that we're not left with a kind of hodgepodge system if this happens again. Um, and that's those are the main things for me. Thanks very much, Raina, and thanks very much to all of our panellists for sharing your thoughts. So we'll go to the questions from the audience now. So our first question comes um, from Victoria, who's asking, um, when speakers talk of 60% or whatever um, protection, uh, I guess, provided by a vaccine, is this 60% less chance of contracting the virus or 60% less severe illness or both. Raina, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, it's the percentage of prevention of symptomatic infection. So you may still get asymptomatic infection. Any other comments from the other panellists on that question? I agree. Okay, so we'll go to the next one, um, which comes from uh, Caroline Bruckner from La Trobe University. How does the panel feel about mandatory vaccinations for healthcare workers, particularly those who work in aged care? Um, Stephen, perhaps you might like to address this one first. Uh, I don't think we should start talking about that until we've made sure that everybody uh, who is an aged care worker who wants to be vaccinated ha can actually get the vaccine and has the opportunity to do it. Um, we're, we're, because the vaccine rollout has been so shambolic, because many aged care workers thought they were going to be covered by the Commonwealth rollout of aged care uh, residents and aged care workers, they might have just waited for this to happen. But, you know, I think the first responsibility is to say, we are going to help these people get vaccinated. And to jump and say, it's your fault for not being vaccinated and we're going to mandate it, I think is just a blaming the victim approach and a uh, trying to distract attention from the fact that we should actually be making it easy for aged care workers to be vaccinated and we're not doing that yet. Thank you. Raina or Mike, do you have any comments to add? Yeah, I might add to that. I completely agree with what Stephen said. I mean, I've heard stories about aged care, people who work in aged care being actually refused vaccination when there were leftover doses and the doses all being packed up and this courier being called to send them back. So it's been made incredibly hard. They work shifts. They're often, we've done quite a bit of research on outbreaks in aged care and also studied the aged care workforce and they're pretty um 
disadvantaged people, often um, of non-English speaking backgrounds, migrants are working two jobs to make ends meet and um, they do shift work, you know, so it's uh, you have to tailor some, you know, you know, ideally you would be bringing vaccination to the workers on the night shift, on the evening shift and the day shift so that everyone has it accessible to them rather than just saying, well, you know, no, you can't have it or when, when, the, when the vaccinators turn up or telling them to go get it themselves. We've also done research showing that for flu vaccine in aged care, if you provide it on site to the workers, the vaccination rates are much higher than if you tell them you go and get it and we'll reimburse you. So you really need to make it easy. Can I just also Thank add you. to that? Um, you, you, you don't, yeah, I want to just add that you don't want to vaccinate every worker in the aged care facility at the same time, because in case they have a reaction to the vaccine, you don't want every worker to be off sick. So it is actually a complex thing to do and to do it properly. But at the moment, we're not doing it properly and we're blaming the workers for not being vaccinated. Thank you. The next question is also on the vaccine rollout. Um, do you think the non-synchronised yet simultaneous rollout of vaccines by the Commonwealth and the state governments have contributed to the stalled vaccine rollout? Stephen, perhaps you might like to answer this one again. So where I start from, Deb, is this, that if we are going to have a mass vaccination program, we need mass vaccination centres. And we started without them. We started with a boutique or bespoke program of, you know, it was just terribly badly organised. I think making it making it's absolutely in my view a good idea for gps to be involved in the vaccine rollout it could be part of a holistic program that your gp offers to you and so i think that was a good idea i think it was a bad idea to say this is what we're basically going to rely on so we needed to have multi-channels to make it easy for different people to get vaccinated in different ways and Certainly, the the mass the, the large vaccination centres have to be part of that. I think where the problems have arisen is uh, in the announcements about who's available for what. As as we've said, there's more AstraZeneca available, and so we can actually have a program for people over 50 running in parallel with a program for people under 50. But the problem with the program for people under 50 is that the 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 rate limiting factor is the availability of Pfizer. I would have moved all the the fires that was allocated to the aged care centres into the uh, the under 50s as soon as we knew that we couldn't use Astra. As soon as the decision was made not to use AstraZeneca for under 50s, we should have used and we should have moved the Pfizer allocations across to actually speed up rollout in the under 50s. And I think this failure to think about all the implications of these decisions is where things have partly gone wrong. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the next question. How quickly can mRNA vaccines be adapted to new COVID variants? And perhaps Raina uh, might like to take the first stab at this question. Yeah, I think it's fairly quick. So it could be done in, you know, up eight weeks, four to eight weeks is what I understand, whereas some of the other technologies can take six months or longer. One participant says, I'm 38 and I'm fine with the associated risks with getting the AstraZeneca vaccine. Why can't I get it? Um, Raina, you, you would you like be to? Able to get it. Um, you're, you're not banned from getting it. Anyone under 50 who wants to get it can still get it. Um, the GPs that are offering it will have uh, just AstraZeneca. I don't think any GPs have Pfizer at this stage. So, um, you know find your uh, closest GP who has it and you should be able to get it. Thank you. Um, so next question's about vaccine hesitancy. I'd be interested to hear what the panel think about the role of the media in vaccine hesitancy. Um, Stephen, would you like to take this one first? So I think there's a, a number of components of this. Um, uh, to some extent, I think the media has overhyped some of the risks uh, of AstraZeneca. And so, surprise, surprise, the 
the public thinks uh, uh, there's, a, there's a huge risk. However, we also know that there's a whole literature about risk of, uh, and, and how people perceive risk. And by and large, we know that people are more tolerant of risks they can control than risks they can't control. And the reaction to the vaccine is in that latter group, risks they can't control. And secondly, they're more, more tolerant of risks that they can see, uh, such as driving in a car um, versus risks they can't see, like what goes into your arms. So there's a whole complexity of, 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 um, of, of risk perception. And I think the media has contributed that we shouldn't entirely blame the media for that. So what we should be saying is, how do we address vaccine hesitancy? And there's no single answer to that. One answer is we have to be working with the culturally and linguistically diverse communities and the Aboriginal communities to address specific issues in those communities. We have to be running an advertising campaign that doesn't send us to sleep uh, because being asleep doesn't help you get your vaccine. So we've got a whole set of things we should be doing and uh, and we're not doing that at the moment. Deb, could I make a comment? Absolutely. Yeah, I have to leave after this, I'm sorry. Um, I think it's a really important point raised by Stephen about risk. And I think the media is kind of confused about how they interpret risk. So on the one hand, they, many, not all, seem to accept that the risk of a leak from hotel quarantine of one in 175, according to Norman's data, uh, uh, one in 175 infected people is kind of okay. And, you know, I saw a, a ridiculous article on the opinion page in The Australian this morning, um, and it was basically saying we don't need a, a purpose-built facility in New South Wales because our hotel quarantine system is so good. And he said, you know, while there may have been one or two suspected leaks from hotel quarantine in New South Wales, we've managed so well. You know, I'm sure you've all been used to this stuff. Um, you know, he ignores the fact that there have been eight different quarantine leaks from New South Wales hotels. And one of them led to an outbreak uh, of almost 200 people in the northern beaches and caused a hit to the Sydney economy of $3 billion in January. And then you look at the risk of um, a clotting event, which my latest calculation is it's one in 75,000 doses of AstraZeneca. And yet you have this sense of panic in some sections of the media. So there's, there's just not a common understanding of what risk is. You know, going back to hotel quarantine, one in 175, if that was an airline that crashed every 175 flights and the airline said, oh, well, you know, we take more passengers than other people, would you fly on that airline? No, I fly on Qatar Airways. No, I wasn't paid to say that um, because they've never had a crash. Um, so really, I think we need to kind of clarify what we mean by risk and the balance of risks and benefits. And bye bye. Yeah, that's very good points. Thank you. And thanks so much for joining us, Mike. Okay. Raina, I think the media you, is an important you... ally. Yeah, I think the media is an important ally as well. So the media can be really helpful in countering oh. vaccine hesitancy, and we need that engagement with media uh, the small caveat to that is probably you know mainstream media is mainly for an older demographic you know young people if you've got uh you know young adult children like i do uh, they don't they don't follow mainstream media they follow an entirely different type of comms like youtube and you know other other sorts of social media uh, but I think that it can be used you know really effectively we saw norman swan for example um I don't know if he had his vaccinations live on TV, but he was certainly tweeting pictures of himself getting the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, so when you have media figures doing that, that can really help as well. So I think we've got to um, utilise the media and, um, you know, make them our allies as best we can. Thanks, Raina.
So the next question is whether a roadmap for vaccines might be viable, a roadmap that includes things like international travel, opening borders, et cetera, or whether there are too many unknowns at the moment to be able to make that sort of roadmap. Uh, and, and the person who's asked the question said that uh, I feel like it would help incentivise getting vaccinated if people knew what they were working towards and what the ultimate goals are. Um, Stephen, would you like to comment? Yes, Deb, I totally agree with that. I think one of the reasons, uh, you know, the, the contributing to vaccine hesitancy, they say, you know, what's the point? Why should I bother? And so on. So I think what government needs to do is to say um, that once we've got, once 80%, 90% of the population has been offered vaccine, vaccination, that is when we're going to start opening the borders. And so there's, there's a complex interaction between when the, the population, the, the thresholds within the population about vaccination and what's going to happen. And we might say earlier than that, uh, if you have been vaccinated, you're allowed to leave the country and come back within whatever. So remove external border controls before we move the, the incoming border controls. But certainly we, want to, we ought to have a clear roadmap which says, Given this, this is what's going to happen. At the moment, the government is in total denial and refusing to talk about it at all. And I think we've got to start engaging that conversation because the, the population has to come along with the idea that we are going to open borders. You know, they're closed now. They're going to be open sometime in the future. We have to know what those criteria are. And yes, there will be risks that, that we will import the, the, um, the, the virus again, but that will be be quite low because a high proportion of the population has been offered vaccination or has taken up vaccination. So I think we've got to have a roadmap because there is a whole lot of benefit to the country. We've got thousands of stranded Aussies overseas who are not coming in. We've got whole industries, international tourism, international education that have been uh, shut down essentially because of our border control policies. And the sooner we get out of that, the better, and the sooner we can actually get back to a, a thriving economy. Thanks, Stephen. And we've just got one final question from Associate Professor Peter Higgs from La Trobe University. What's the single most important thing that we need to do now to ensure that Australia continues to successfully manage the pandemic into the future? Raina, would you like to give us your views? Yeah. Vaccination, vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. That is the end game. That's the exit strategy. That's the hope. So we really need to get those vaccination rates up, get the population protected. Thank you. Stephen, do you have anything to add? I have nothing to add. It's the right answer. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much um, to all of our eminent speakers um, and thank you to the audience for, for listening and for the um, very interesting questions uh, to put to the speakers as well. Thank you.